Feeding Strategies for Geology 204. Today, we will be talking about the different feeding strategies of organisms. The organisms that we will be focusing on are vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, and microfossils. To demonstrate these feeding strategies, we will be analyzing four different papers that talk about a feeding strategy for the four different types of organisms. With these papers, we will also look at when these feeding strategies occur. Feeding strategies are the methods by which an organism sustains itself through an externally acquired source of energy, food. These methods could be preserved in the fossil records a couple different ways. The creatures or organisms feeding apparatus itself, such as mouth or stomach, could be preserved in the fossil. There could be trace fossils, such as excrement or stomach lining or food particles that are products of food. Or the, the organism's biological form could be preserved with its methods of digestion still intact. Some of the most common feeding strategies include filter feeding, which is when an organism ingests particles from within water, such as krill or prankton. These are often creatures that live on the surface or beneath the shallow surface of water. Deposit feeding, which is ingesting particles from within soil, such as worms and butterflies or other creatures that feed directly from the ground. Fluid feeding, which is ingesting the fluids of another organism, such mm -hmm. as mosquitoes, which consume blood, hummingbirds, which consume nectar, or any other insect, which consumes liquid from a tree, or bulk feeding, which is consuming the entirety of another organism. This is what humans and most mammals do, consumption of solid food. Hello, my name is Reed Wehrmeister, and I will be talking about the uh, research paper entitled Late to the Table, Di Diversification of Tetrapod Man." biomechanics lag behind the evolution of terrestriality by Philip S.L. Anderson, Matt Friedman, and Marcello Ruda. This paper talks about how uh, first land animals kept fish-like jaws for millions of years before they started developing jaws and diets that were for their good, for their land-based diets, for their habitat that they were in now. Uh, this occurred to the middle to the late Devon, Devonovan era, and the paper was written in Massachusetts, but this type of uh, occurrence happened everywhere around the world. At first, the original interpretation that I got was that scientists believed that animals had developed legs before these new land-based animals developed eating habits and had the right feeding systems to support them while on land, but there's no strong evidence to support this hypothesis. So the question that we ask ourselves is, do these land-based animals develop feeding habits after developing legs to adapt to land living? <clears throat> well, in the paper, some methods of in investigation that the scientists used were these things called biomechanical metrics that compared the jaws of tetrapods to their fish-like ancestors. They examined 89 fossils from around the world, and they used one method called mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is how is the measurement of how much force an animal, an animal uses for their jaw. You can look, when you see these different animals, some animals might use more jaw strength for one type of food, and some animals might use a different type of jaw strength. Scientists compared these jaws and recorded what they found, and after they recorded the measurements, they calculated the rates at which the jaws evolved. <clears throat> In conclusion, it turns out that looking at these fossils, it took more than just a new environment to trigger evolution. Evolution takes millions of years to happen, and this is present in the findings that Philip Anderson came across. He found it took a very long time for the jaw to develop into the jaw that is used for land and based science. So once we reinterpret the paper, animals did in fact develop legs much before they developed eating habits and eating systems that resembled land based diets. <laughs> this is evident in the jaw measurements of the 89 different fossils, and the calculations of the rate of change in the jaws from fish-like animals to early tetrapods. My name is Tyler Carnavali, and the paper that we're going to be looking at is called Mid-Cretaceous Charred Fossil Flowers Reveal Direct Observation of Arthropod Feeding Strategies. The paper examined charred fossils of mid-Cretaceous flowers that were found with the fossil of a mite nymph and a few fossilized scales of mosquitoes that were hypothesized to be feeding on the pollen of the angiosperms. Uh, these fossils were found in the mid-Cretaceous period and more specifically the late Albion to the early Cenomanian periods and were found in the Rhenish Massif in Germany. 
Uh, the original interpretation of this paper was that the researchers were unsure of how invertebrates, such as arthropods, especially terrestrial insects, adapted to the rise in angiosperms on land during the Cretaceous period. Uh, invertebrate fossils from this time period are extremely rare, but the wildfires preserve these charred fossils, and from fossils like these, researchers have begun to piece together the missing parts of the story between the connections between arthropods and angiosperms. The question I would like to ask is at what point in history did terrestrial arthropods begin to feed on the pollen of angiosperms? And did this symbiotic relationship lead to the survival of certain vertebrates over others? The methods of investigation in the paper were that based on palynostratigraphical analyses and the angiosperm flower association, the sediments were most likely to be of late Albion or early Cenomanian age. All arthropod specimens had been isolated from the clay in pristine condition and showed good anatomical preservation because of the charcoalification from the wildfires during the time. The researchers compared the two scales found attached to the fossil flower to scale structures of extant representatives of possible angiosperm flower visitors from today. Sediments were separated from the specimens using hydrogen peroxide and other chemical soaks, and these specimens were kept in pristine condition. The conclusion was that from these finds, researchers were able to conclude that terrestrial arthropods were in fact feeding on the pollen of angiosperms by the mid-Cretaceous period, and these terrestrial invertebrates acted as pollinators for many of the new angiosperm species. Arthropods were able to adapt to the new angiosperm plants arising all over the world during the Cretaceous, and animals such as mosquitoes and mite nymphs, which were discussed in this paper, were able to survive better by using the pollen as a source for food. My name is Sean Kemp, and my paper was The Record of Australian Jurassic Plant Arthropod Interactions by Stephen McLuhan, Sarah K. Martin, and Robert Beattie. Geologists studied the fossils of Jurassic plants that reveal damage from arthropod feeding from the late Triassic through the Jurassic in southeastern Gondwana in Australia. Geologists noticed that types of flora changed drastically from the late Triassic into the Jurassic, but the terrestrial invertebrate herbivores were able to continue their established feeding patterns, meaning they were able to adjust considerably. My question is, could the feeding strategies of arthropods during the Jurassic have led to the mass diversification of angiosperms during the mid-Cretaceous period. The methods of investigation are as follows. Scientists personally examined several institutions' collections containing major Australian Jurassic terrestrial fossil assemblages. Scientists also have undertaken intensive sampling of Jurassic plant and arthropod fossils over the past two decades. Additionally, they examined plant fossils for evidence of vegetative physical defenses against her herbivory and insect fossils for evidence of mimesis. They concluded that the arthropods were, had little to no trouble in adapting their feeding strategies to the angiosperms of the Jurassic period. The arthropod damage was split into a few types of feeding, those being leaf margin feeding, surface feeding, lamina hole feeding, galling, piercing and sucking, leaf mining, boring, and ava position. These types of damage are spread across a wide range of fern and gymnosperm taxa. Angiosperms did develop defensive mechanisms. They were, however, ineffective against arthropod feeding. It is likely the feeding patterns contributed to the mass diversification of angiosperms in the Cretaceous period. My name is Asher Mirovich, and my paper was Tassilia ordomensis, a biogenic structure of probable deposit feeding and gardening meldonid polycates, by Eduardo B. Olivero and Maria I. Lopez Caballero. Tassilia ordomensis is a trace fossil that is thought to be left by an annelid worm in the form of a long shaft punctuated by a lining of rings. These fossils are generally found to have belonged in the Upper Cretaceous to Cenozoic eras um, and are most commonly found in the Antarctica and in Tierra del Fuego. Um, there is a great deal of uncertainty. There was a great deal of uncertainty as to what sort of creature produced Tassilia ordomensis and as such what sort of function the trace fossil seems to have played in that creature's biological function. The original interpretation of this fossil is that T. ordomensis was the trace fossil of a Dominicnion or Equilibricnium worm, which are deep water worms that leave traces of their burrows um, in the ground. As such, T. ordomensis would have been a fossil of the creature's uh, skeleton, so to speak, or not skeleton, 
As such, Geodimensis would have been a fossil of the creature's body with the external envelopes of skin that puzzled scientists uh, sort of acting as accumulated uh, detritus formed as the worm would burrow into the ground. The detritus would sort of form this uh, cocoon around the worm to act as protection and serve st for stability. The question that scientists raised um, in this paper is that the internal structure and growth forms of the worms don't match up with the things that we know about Dumicnian and equilibrium biology. Um, it makes sense, therefore, to ask that perhaps T. ordomensis could have been the trace of a different organism with a different function entirely. The way that they were investigated this organism is by collecting over 400 samples of Tassili ordomensis from both Antarctica and Tierra del Fuego, and they were collected and compared against what we know about deepwater worms that may have left such a trace fossil. They compared the rock and soil minute found within T. ordomensis and the composition of the habitats of potential host worms, and most importantly, they compared the feeding strategies between the deep water worms and the shallow water worms, which would have been deeply indicative of the biological formation of those worms. Reassessment of the potential function of T. ordomensis was natural once it was noted that it belonged to one of the other related worms and not the deep water worms as was originally thought. The old interpretation was that T. ordomensis was made by a creature in the Pognophora class, which is a deep water worm that lives near, the, near or inside the ocean floor. It has an internal separation between its digestive tract and its bowels, and it grew from its head in an upward, so to speak, direction. The puzzling area of T. ordomensis is the sort of accumulated hard area around its digestive tract, which, according to this original interpretation, served to add body weight and stabilize the organism. The new interpretation, however, was that T. ordomensis is a trace fossil left by a maldonite worm, which lived not in deep water but in shallow water, and had vertically stacked inner rings, which is more consistent with the trace fossil. It had no internal separation, and it grew and burrowed in a downward, so to speak, direction. Um, this interpretation allows us to view the digestive area in between not as just another part of the standard digestive tract, but as a component for culturing bacteria that the maldonite worm would have consumed, which is something that was not relevant to the deep water worm. Because the maldonite worm consumed bacteria, it had this sort of extra chamber on the bottom of its structure that took that bacteria and sort of biologically interpreted it to be relevant and helpful to the creature's life. The reinterpretation, therefore, Tassilia ordomensis was the trace fossil of a maldonite worm formed protrusively as a consequence of deposit and detritus feeding strategies. Its heavy internal sedimentary envelope was formed from burrowing through sediment and internalizing that detritus that it was burrowing through, which indicates that it, its potential host was indeed a maldonite worm, which burrowed through soil and other things like that. This interpretation allows us to reconsider the secondary digestive chamber as more sensical and applicable bacterial culturing area instead of merely a further part of the same digestive tract. The bacteria ingested through this worm's newly assigned deposit feeding strategy would be cultivated and put to use through this part of T. ordomensis. As you can see by looking at this PowerPoint presentation, we have dove into the four different types of organisms and their different feeding strategies. When looking at the course of history of organic life and its evolution, the feeding strategies of countless species and organisms have adapted to the changes presented to them and in their environments. In each section of this presentation, from the development of modern jaw structure, to the feeding strategies of terrestrial arthropods, to the bacteria culturing inside of Telusia or Dementis, one can see that many adaptations needed to be made in organisms' feeding strategies in order to survive are very present. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great day.